So in the series on Bach Czerny, the comparisons between uh, the tempi that Czerny gave for Bach's inventions, the original ones, I have to warn always people that dive into it, it themselves and go on IMSLP and download a later 19th century score for the inventions. Uh, later editors changed Czerny's tempi without giving any notice. So in that series, we arrive at number 10 and I'm not going to introduce the entire series, but if you're new here, you click on this video in this series. The point of this is like making a comparison between performances, nine performances that we do every piece. And I would say every week, but it's not every week that these uh, videos are published, but to uh, see what performance when they don't check the metronome marks in music that is not considered to be virtuosic by nature, um, what they actually do. And the result is, we will make an overview at the end of the series, that um, actually the majority of the players and certainly the average, even taking into account the fastest ones like Lizitsa, sometimes Glenn Gold is also very fast. I sometimes wonder with this guy. I mean, I say nev nobody checks met Chinese, met Chinese metronome marks, but in the case of Glenn Gold, I'm always a little puzzled because um, that's just a point of uh, a side point, a side note. But for, for instance, with the Appassionata scandal recording, he is exactly in Holby Czerny. Uh, the Alla Turca he plays from Mozart, did he check uh, 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 Czerny or Marshallis? I mean, he's there very close, if not spot on whole beat. It's like whether he is there or he tries to go as fast as possible. Um, so with him, I don't know. But um, all the rest, of course, the average, even in, even with Lizitsa, who says like, these are just etudes for me. I play them as fast as I can, which is a pretty strong straight statement and very interesting in this regard that there is at least one player that tries to play them all, maybe not all, there was the F minor, I believe, where she was clearly in the middle of the group, uh, where music started to take over in, in a sense. But overall, it's an important statement because there we know for sure that she, as a player, tries to do her best to play them as fast as possible. Some will, some say in the comments like, yeah, but she's not, she's not actually playing as fast as possible. Well, but that's of course a nonsensical argument when she's making the claim that she does. And it's not saying that nobody can play faster. The aim of this series is again to see what happens when performers just make music and not think about tempo at all. I mean, let's face it, that most, the majority of performers including myself here. I'm featuring myself in the 2015 or so recording of the inventions. I was not thinking about like, let's take now the principles of the tempo ordinario and apply them here and see what information we have and to come to a kind of tempo reconstruction. Um, I'm overall of the slowest players. That's maybe no surprise because I mean, that's a complete other video. I shouldn't make that, make that uh, statement here or just try to explain that. But th the fact that I looked into these metronome marks on a certain point is, of course, something that came forth from a certain uh, musical practice that I already had. So there was a certain match. So it's, but I wasn't looking into Czerny's metronome marks here. As I'm recording the well-tempered clavier now, I am looking at the Czerny metronome marks, but you have to be aware they were made for the piano in that time. So I'm not saying it's not influencing my work, but you get my point. And so um, it's important to have this in mind that this is not something like, okay, can players actually reach a single beat? In this number 10, there will, will be one player that reaches a single beat. It is Glenn Gold. Um, but the overall idea is like when we show then the result in single beat or when players play in single beat and we give them we give an entire overview of nine players then oftentimes people will be shocked there are some people that say like yeah listen that was just how Cherny played that's a whole other discussion um, the point being is that for these works of Bach when we upgrade them to single beat Cherny style like he played them even though in men, in some and I mean in many instances of these fifteen, I think in eleven of, out of fifteen, nobody reached a single beat. Even those who tried, um, then we just have to assume that he did. Or um, 
there was something else going on. But for box music, it's very clear that the tempi that we reach when people try to read single beat become very close to what Beethoven had in his sonatas or other composers for that matter. And so when it's a matter, it's a thing also of getting used to something. When we play the Hamid Lavier sonatas fugue, I'm just using that example as over and over again because it's the most important one or the most known one, I would say. Uh, there are other fugues as well that are really fast, but there we see a metro mark in 4 4 time a quarter note 144 um, which is not so exceptional if you see metron the metronomization of Czerny here for these inventions which I mean go sometimes even faster and when we upgrade or up yeah upgrade or update what you what you want in uh, of change digitally digitally uh, speed up the performances if no one reaches single beat to single beat then most of the time people are like pretty shocked of the result that's no that's no music anymore but in the case of Beethoven we are so used to those fast performances even though in a few very few reach that number and even though some do reach that number it's with compromises when it becomes very complex or it's with compromises in regard to pedal use and things like that but you see there is there is this this split of Bach Beethoven it, there is a connection there. I'm not saying there is no there was no evolution, but there is a connection there. But our listening habits are so strong sometimes that we tend to forget that there is a listening habit. And in the case of Bach, it's so it's so it's so uh, brilliant, I would say, but it's so eye opener and ear opener for many to see what happens if we apply the same logic that people today apply to um, Beethoven, Czerny, Moschler's metronomization in single beat and we do the same with Bach then there is some friction there and that's the entire um, point of the entire series so there I gave a short introduction anyways maybe because the last recording um, episode of this was quite a while ago a few weeks so without further ado this is number 10 uh, it's in 9-8 presto I mean uh, what Czerny writes there so he sees it as a very fast uh, piece and of course that's and in, in, in that uh, um, uh, triggers people to say like okay but that's then you cannot go slower because presto indicates like it's just one step from prestissimo which is described as the fastest you can play and that's of course a very complex discussion because um, you can say like when you when you drive with your car in the village you are allowed to drive as fast as you can but the fastest you can drive is like in in belgium at least 30 kilometers an hour like or 50 um, depending if you're in a village or in a school uh, environment so it depends on what the notation of course gives you there is some element there that also needs to make you aware that what was considered to be fast in those days and and some people say yeah but that cannot be a difference and it's very dangerous to just assume that people 200 years ago had the same impression on very relative terms like speed like fast and slow and hot and cold i mean if we would dare now in winter time in 1820 or in 1800 um, I, th I think we would freeze to death in those houses where there was one fire and, 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 and you, you, you see my point I, I also make the case or give the example so often of Marshallis who was the, an invited guest of the one of the f first train journeys and if you have heard me tell the story I mean I'm sorry to be repetitive but it's such an important element to realize that when he describes that first train journey um you have the impression that the guy was like participating in a mission in a space shuttle i mean the way he describes that is like it was so fast the speed that everything came to me like with the speed of an arrow out of a bow like and if you then realize that actually that train had a speed of about 19 miles an hour 27 kilometers an hour then you suddenly realize that the impressions people had back then and the way they described something is different than in our time and you can say okay yeah but here is a presto i mean that's just a keyboard peter people practice then as well huh? they were not like amateur amateur amateurs and i'm not saying that it's just the impression if jenny writes here presto the question is what did he actually mean 
What did he mean by going faster than Allegro and just below like as fast as possible? Did he mean like as fast as you can play or that's still within the musical boundaries of that time? And that's a very, that's, that's hard to answer. Eh? It's not black and white. And if you take a single beat perspective, you say that's all nonsense. Is you're just making the case for whole beat. But that's exactly the case. <laughs> we are making that case. So it's, it's just, and, and you can say like there, you're biased. But it's actually not entirely true. You're just looking at the facts here from a different perspective and you see it makes sense. So all saying that in this case, 9-8, the, what exactly was meant by Presto is hard to say. We look at the metronome mark and there we have two options. We have two possibilities. What the effect in single beat will be, we will see um, uh, later. I hope, by the way, that uh, the video will not be blocked because Glenn Gold's recordings are very hard to share, even uh, some seconds. So we'll see about that. 9-8, um, before we uh, dive into, or I'm, I'm sharing with you the uh, overview of the 9 performers, 9-8 is a pretty complex time signature, as actually all the 8 notes time signatures are. Uh, because they they cover a, a large variety, variety and notation. You have eight note notations like here, but you have also nine eights. Maybe nine eights a little bit less than um, than three eight. But you, no nine eight with sixteen notes is also some common practice. Six eight, twelve eight, of course, three eight. But in three eight, you would have also and certainly later. But also already in box time, we covered that in previous episodes. Go back and check those where you have a 3 8 in a very open structure harmonically and the notation meaning in terms of used note values. And you have a very dense, complex harmonic structure like every eight, eight note it changes with a lot of syncopations with even the use of 30 second notes. So there you have a clear distinction. In 9 8, uh, the, the, the faster you go, or I would say the higher you go in like 3 8, 6 8, 9 8, 12 8 you see that 12 8 sometimes is a very open structure where you could say like it's a full four where you avoid the triplets 9 8 is like on on the way to that but it's very complex um Kirnberger, if I'm not mistaken, he talks about time signatures and he says about 9-8, but don't, don't, I'm just quoting from memory now, that he says like it's very similar to 3-4, but um, if 9-8 or 6-8, or uh, if 9-8 were just to be 3-4 with, with triplets, or 6-8 were to be just 2-4 with triplets, or 12-8 were to be just 4-4, four, four, but then uh, with triplets, then there would be no use for these time signatures to exist. And so um, he says the difference is not always uh, there in tempo, uh, in, in the Bewegung, he says, if I'm not mistaken. But in the way you treat the eighth notes, in the case of the triplets, 3-8, three 3-4 three I mean, if this would be written in 3-4, and he actually advises to give uh, to do the exercise, just rewrite it in 3-4 and see what happens when you play it. Then in 3-4, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he says like you cannot have a harmonic change or a weight on the last note of that triplet, it's just clearly 1-1, one, one, two, three, yakata, takata, takata, whatever tempo you take, but the emphasis is on the first eighth note, whereas in nine, eight, the eighth notes can be a little bit lighter in performance, but it is allowed to have a kind of, I mean, accentuated note on the third eighth note of the of that of that group is not really like accentuated accentuated but you can have a little bit of emphasis there you see ornaments there you see uh, things of that nature and so in general it is a little bit conflicting there like the tempo is the same the triplets might be played a little bit uh, not faster but a little bit lighter but the tempo can be a little bit slower because of the eighth notes the importance or the eighth notes being more important than the eighth notes in the triplets and three four i hope you can still follow me so there you have a field of yeah okay what is this this is of course some a piece without 16th notes so you are you are pushing the tempo a little bit because of the lack of the of the 16th notes. Maybe that's the reason why Czerny said presto. So you see there is also, that's also a connection. You see that also in a lot of Haydn and Mozart and even Beethoven, uh, but certainly Haydn and Mozart, where they have last movements, 2-4, they indicate allegro molto or presto. But what does it mean when the 2-4 is actually meant as a 4-8? You see, 
you dare actually go slower in tempo and you compensate by a faster metronome mark here the same thing when Czerny would say like okay but guys this is a piece without uh, 16th notes eh? so this is of the faster 9 eighths so I give it presto meaning compared to a normal 9 8 with 16th notes but this doesn't have it so the tempo goes up but when you say okay but this is a presto starting from a 9 8 with only 8 notes then you go even higher in tempo see it's very complex it's not black and white um we will see by the way in the single beat performance of glenn gold that he leaves out all the ornaments that's a sign there that there is something wrong um Keep in mind, and that's my take on the 9-8 and in general on many 8th note structures that uh, time signatures, that you have to be able to give, that's, that's just the way I see it, by reading, I mean these things like, I think Kirenberg is the most specific on, 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 this, uh, on this issue. Uh, maybe it's not, maybe there are other sources, but I, I, I don't think you will find anything very specific like here I'm going to make a case for all 9-8 structures, like say in Bach's work or Mozart's work, and from that time, and that's how you have to play it. I don't think that exists. It would be great if it did, and if, it, if you know a source, please leave it in the comment section. I would be happily looking at it. And even then, I would assume that, how can you describe that? But my take on it is that if you have an 8-note structure, um, that in that and and that's a little bit conflicting with Gimberg that the eighth note gets a little bit more weight because you have to be able to articulate it in a different way. If you play like a triplet, yaka ta taka ta tak, all the, the the two you have one the first emphasized note and the two other notes are actually connected with the first. If you have three eighth note, ya pa pam, and every note can bear can have a weight like Kirchenberger also describes. Also the last one, ya ta tam pa pam pam, it affects the tempo, but also the way you articulate and your touch is going to be different. And you hear me doing that actually in this recording. I'm giving more emphasis on the eighth note structure and as we move on through the uh, through the overview you will see I and mean, you will hear that it's done less and less that people are going that slowly you will hear people are going to play um and, and even the harpsichord like Tom Koopman he, it's like a triplet if you would write if you have to write that piece just by ears rhythmically you would probably write triplets in a three four and not eight notes in a nine eight and that's something you have to consider you have to really consider if you're listening to music if you play music that's the basic rule if i would hear this what would i write if you hear beethoven's fifth symphony played by gardner or zander would you still write eight notes probably not and, and, and there you have to ask the question like, how can I match the notation in my playing? And it's, a, it's like an open field. But there are some aspects like here, three, four with triplets and nine, eight with eight notes that can, can guide you there. Okay, enough talking. I'm going to show you the overview of nine performances, what they make of this invention. So if I take you to the overview, then we'll see here, so Czerny's tempo is dotted quarter note 160, 
And so compared to single beat interpretation, I am the slowest. I'm on 44%, so a little bit below whole beat. Uh, Nikolaeva, 59%. Schiff, Leonard, there's a group of three um, that are around 60%. I would say that's that's st still fine. I mean, all the recordings are fine. I'm not I'm not judging the performance, the performers. I'm just saying from the perspective that I would say like, okay, this is where I would uh, take the piece to 60%. I, I think that's 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 a fast performance, but um, still you have the impression there, I believe in Leonard's case, it's still clear the, the, the ornaments are really, really spot on. Um, but from Koopman, you have a little bit of a blur. I mean, it, again, it's a great performance, a eh? great performer. But there changes something. And there changes for me the impression that you have. It's 9, 8, 2, 3, 4. Meyer goes even faster. Gizikink is always problematic. Uh, Lizitsa 91%, Gold 100%. So Gold is, on, uh, uh, is here reaching single beat. Uh, without and leaving out the ornaments so it's it's also important to know and to notice before you you jump into the comment box and see it's all possible when people want i mean it's not really because you cannot take this out of the context in the in in the overview only of the inventions in box and box journey comparison uh, we will have at least 10 uh, overview of recordings where people do not reach the single beat version in the inventions can you see the implication of this? It's huge, eh? because the inventions, I mean, in terms of playing, they are extremely difficult. I mean, Bach is, is chasing the player all over the place in terms of polyphony and just releases and attack and timing and everything of that. It's complete independence of the two hands. But we're speaking here, of course, not about that. We're speaking here about uh, numbers of uh, notes per second you can play. That's 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 the foundational start i mean all the other things all the other problems like glenn gold leaving out ornaments here or as we discussed in previous episodes when people play very very fast they hit with their face to the wall when they come to the end of the piece because they have to pull up the brakes i mean otherwise they will just crash into the end of the piece all those kinds of problems that you come across it's it's like we leave it out eh? Uh, it's just a number of notes per second, so it's just the tip of the iceberg, and the entire iceberg is underwater. Eh? But even in the case of the inventions, where one has to say, like, okay, this is not of the complexity of the Hammerklavier Sonata Fugue, let's be honest. And even there, in 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 sixty six percent of the cases, nobody reaches single beat, even though one of the players. I, I have to repeat it because it's so important. Announces on her channel that she's trying to, and maybe not go after Cherny's single beat metronome, but she's trying to play as fast as she can, while Cherny marks the pieces as easy pieces for beginners. So there is something definitely wrong here. And by the way, this is also an interesting example because some people ask me oftentimes, you have these uh, dotted um, uh, metronome marks, like here, dotted quarter note. Um, how do you play that with a metronome? Because it takes like in two. And it's actually pretty simple. Um, if I just give you, and certainly in a case like this, um, you have to re you have to always imagine and remember we come from a pendulum time. So uh, where the pendulum and the metronome, um, the, the pendulum is a conversion from up down of the arm of the hand into left right. I mean it's obvious. Mersenne describes that, or I mean it's it's if we not literally describes that, I cannot. I don't know from memory, but I mean it's so obvious that you convert this into left right. The metronome does the same. Um, and with the ticks, of course, you introduce a new element. And there is, but we work it out in the book, and I'll come back into videos also, there is, of course, a start of, of, of not a problem, but a challenge, because there, when you have a pendulum swing from left to right, it's very musical. Eh? You have this turning point where suddenly, you know, you, 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 it's unbelievable how the eye can predict where the turning point is. It's with a precision that is remarkable. You have to try that and you can play with that, even in Tactus Inequalis, because that is, this, that's what it's about. Like you have one, two, three, one, two, three, yum, pum, 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 But he, of course, with the metronome, you have this confirmation, audible confirmation of the tick there. And that makes it sometimes complex. But if I put the metronome 160, you will see it's not so hard in this tempo. So what you typically would do with the metronome as you have two functions of a metronome. 
It's one as a time indicator, and it's also a practicing tool. It's a little bit later, but even from, I mean, people discovered this as a practicing tool, obviously, to learn to keep time and like to just check if your tempo is stable throughout the piece. I mean, we still do that today. I mean, most professional players do that. Um, so the, the, the true practice is you have, like Jenny writes, or you, you just have the machine tick, and you take the tempo, Dang, dang, dang. And then you close. Ram, pam, ram, pam, 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 in tactus inequalities, it's actually no problem. So guys, there you have it. Number 10, we have an average of 70%, uh, which is closer to whole beat than to single beat, even though uh, Glenn Gold reaches whole beat, uh, single beat, and Lizitza is doing her best to come there. So 70%, I would say, is again, even on the whole beat side, but uh, that's just the last conclusion. Okay. We're going up, we're going to the next one, number 11. It will be interesting as always. Thanks for watching, uh, subscribing to the, to the channel and also checking out our Patreon page. Uh, you help us, uh, for instance, writing this insanely thick book on temporary reconstruction that hopefully will appear this year. Manuscript is about to be finished. I said a few weeks of work. I'm always saying that at the end of the videos, but it's true. It's a slow process, but we're getting there. Okay, thanks for watching. See you soon again. Bye.